Cool, awesome. Well, welcome, everybody. This is great. Thanks for coming out here. I think this is the only UX-ish talk at the conference. Is that right? It's cool. Like, yeah. yeah, this is great. I'm, um, I'm jazzed there's like an interest in that out here, too. Um, yeah. So this is UX and engineering. Um, we dropped the tale of two cities. We were going to do like a Mark Twain thing, but it just didn't work out. Um, so forgive us. We never updated the, the slides on, uh, on the, the website, but um, or the title on the website. So if you're disappointed and <laughs> they're not being a Mark Twain, I'm so sorry. No Mark Twain. You can Twain leave job. now. Yeah, you can leave sorry. now. Yeah. Uh, get out. Um, but we'll, the meat of the talk will still be the same, I promise. <laughs> um, OK, cool. So uh, this is UX and engineering. Uh, I'm Joe Carlson. Um, and uh, I'm technical lead for BestBuy.com. I'm an engineer. Um, I've been there for about two years. Uh, and uh, those are my socials. Uh, I'm going to be posting, Eddie and I will be both posting the slides to this talk on our Twitters after this talk. So if you want to, it's a good way to go find us. Um, also, my website's got my socials on there too. Cool. Sweet. My name is Edward Ecker. Um, I'm currently a UX designer on search and the list page of BestBuy.com. Um, I've also worked in the past on the product details page, uh, so like right before you hit, about to hit Add to Cart, that's my page, um, and also the pattern library at BestBuy.com. Yeah, yeah. And those are my socials as well. <laughs> All right. Cool. So this talk, um, if you haven't read the intro blurb statement or whatever, um, this is going to be a talk. Eddie and I are going to be talking about practical tips that we use and we have found that help us work together better, um, right? Because typically, there, you have this like idea that engineers are cold and hard, and they say no a lot. And UX has a million ideas, and they're always bugging us, and they're angry right? when we can't do what they want. Um, right? It's just like creative versus like mathy people. Um, and Eddie and I, we don't think that that's true. right? We don't think that that's, we think that that's a, a harmful, Myth, urban legend, idea, uh, and we want to try to help like systematically break that down. We have a solution. We have a solution. There is a way. Um, wait, this is one, a couple more things. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'll go back. Uh, perfect. There we go. Um, okay. So I just want to get a quick sense of like who's in the room. Um, is there who's a dev? Who's a U engineer? Okay. Cool. I figured this is like mostly a dev conference. Is there any UX people in here? Got a couple, half. Yes. What about like front end engineers? Yes. Who's a front end engineer? <laughs> cool. And then back end engineers? Cool. Awesome. Okay, great. That's an interesting mix. Yeah. Um, actually, I'm surprised the number of back end engineers here, too, because yeah, cool. typically don't work with UX people quite as much, too. But yeah. I'm glad you're here. So glad you're here. Awesome. Um, let's see here. Uh, uh, okay, cool. Anyway, yep. Sorry. Um, nope, you're good. Uh, so, um, yeah, so. This is us just getting uh, you guys kind of familiar with what we're going to talk about. Uh, we want to set the table for you. Yep. Um, so the first thing we'd like to discuss is improving team morale and team engagement. Because like Joe was saying, we are currently potentially butting heads a lot, and we want to we move away from that, right? Yeah. Well, and the better you can get along with your coworkers, like, the, the more fun you're going to have at work, right? Like... I've had who's had a job here, right, where you like are having conflict with the first time team, right? That just it makes it really hard to go in, like want to go into work, right? Um, and it, I think it's a job. For, it's a job that we need to like actively work on to improve relationships at work. Absolutely, yep. Um, so the other big thing we're going to touch on is driving innovation, right? So I think it kind of goes without saying that a lot of us are innovative people, right? We want to like push the boundaries on what's possible. Um, but as Joe was saying, that might not always pan out. Uh, for example, you might want to build you know, an AR feature into your web app and realize, um, the dev realizes that that's you know, somewhat of an impossibility. Um, but they realize it too late, and then you have to tell our business stakeholders that we can't do AR in our web app. So um, just trying to figure out how we can innovate uh, and be smart about it, mm -hmm. right? And, and a lot of that boils down to upfront communication. Yep. Um, the other thing that we wanted to touch on is getting lean. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a buzzword that we've heard a lot, um, and it's something that I think there's a lot of different definitions for. Um, so we want to talk about what our lean UX process looks like. 
Um, for us as UX, this is really about the idea of less documentation, less handoff, mm -hmm. and forget about it, and more conversation, right? More conversation throughout the whole process. Um, so we're gonna introduce this idea of a dev design workshop mm -hmm. um, and talk about how you can get closer to being lean at your own companies. So as engineers, I think we really need UX to help make our products amazing. Um, I think stereotypically, engineers are not known for making uh, really beautiful GUIs. Um, the thing I that comes to mind is like AWS's uh, developer shell, right? It's kind of hard, it's hard to navigate. Um, uh, but, and for us on our teams, I think that when we come together and work with the designers, that's when we really polish up our product and make it like, take it to the next level of professionalism. Like, we just, we need each other to make amazing products, and that's what this is about. If we can improve that, we can make better things. Totally. So what this talk isn't about, you can still leave if you want to. <laughs> um, so trying to make perfect comps, right? So as UXers, um, we, we tend to wanna perfect everything in design, and in the world of responsive, that just doesn't make sense. Um, because responsive design, there's, there's so many breakpoints, there's so many different views you have to consider, uh, mobile, tablet. Um, it, it just becomes wasted work, in my opinion, right? So how can we get design into the front end? Um, and that, again, ties into this idea of this dev design workshop. Like, what is a good enough handoff for our developers to then get started and then have UX pair with dev to, to actually lay everything out in code? Mm -hmm. Because let's be real, I don't know if you guys um, have had experience with this, but maybe a devil or a designer will hand you off something. You, you'll run it through QA, and uh, design will see it like towards the end of the sprint, and realize that you did it wrong, or you didn't do it to their you know their standard, right? So then you have all these extra bugs that end up going in the backlog, and they might never get touched because you know the priorities are build more features, right? So um, let's try to catch all that stuff before. We have to go through QA um, to make sure that you know we we don't have to have this redundant cycle of you know finding design bugs. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is hoarding designs until they're ready. So this is not something you should be doing um, as a UXer. Uh, I'm guilty of this. This is something that I've done, um, waiting till it's you know, absolutely perfect to show my product manager um, and. Our typical cadence uh, from how we've worked in the past is, you know, you'll have weekly product meetings where you kind of showcase your work. And I feel like that's too long of a time span. I think we need to be meeting um, more frequently, maybe every other day, if not daily, um, to answer any questions that come up while we're designing, right? Because questions come up all the time. And I feel like a lot of times design will wait until they have that meeting to get those questions answered. But why can't we get those questions answered now? You know, why do we have to wait and go down a path that might not be the right path? It's just wasting time, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and over engineering. So this is obviously something that engineers need to work on too. Um, I think over engineering can mean a lot of different things. It could be either kind of spending too much time solving a problem. Um, what's the uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil? I think that's a common uh, idiom in engineering, right? Um, uh, but I think with, in regards to design, um, I've, I saw this happen recently on my team. Someone, uh, an engineer had an idea, which is great. They have an idea for a, something that needed to be, like a feature for this thing, um, but it was something that no one had asked for, and he had burned a couple days working on this feature that no one had really wanted, trying to make it like overcomplicated. Uh, and we kind of had to sync up with our design team, right, and it was like, we had wasted a couple days of work over engineering this thing that no one really asked for. Um, and if he had kind of just synced up earlier, it probably would have saved him and us like a lot of time. So this UX and engineering collaboration is not about <laughs> excessive over engineering. All right. No, 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 no. <laughs> now that we get all that out of the way. Yep. <laughs> let's, uh, let's dive into some common problems. So this is, uh, kind of a familiar pattern that I've seen. I've worked at a couple different shops in my day, and uh, this is um, pretty standard, right? You have product planning up front. This is a feature timeline, by the way. So you have product, product planning up front, 
and they're taking a lot of time to, to figure out what they want to build, and they're talking to their business stakeholders, and they're figuring out like what the business needs are, and they don't really understand like what UX is and where UX fits into the equation. And I've had it happen where I've been passed over wireframes from my product partners and told, hey, why don't you build this thing? Mm-hmm. You know, This is what the business team wants because this is what we sold them on in that meeting that you weren't in, right? And then we become order takers, and UX does not want to be order takers. You know, we want to solve problems. We want to solve customer problems. We want to understand that. We want to dig into user research and do all that fun stuff. And this kind of circumvents all that and says, hey, we have the solution already figured out. Go build it, right? So we become order takers. And we become order takers in a very tight time window. We can't really push back and say no because we promised the business team that it would be built, you know, a month from now. So we got to get this thing designed in front of dev, like ASAP, right? So then dev kind of gets the brunt of this too, because maybe what the business was promised is also a big problem for dev. And now dev has questions, but they don't have enough time to push back and say no, because it's already been sold up the funnel, up the food chain, right? So now dev has to work on this feature that they don't want to build because UX gave them the feature that they don't want to build because product sold this feature to the business team because they wanted to look good for their boss, right? Not okay. Um, Now, it could also look like this. This is, I'd say, a more current day model where you have UX and product kind of co-planning features together, right? So they're talking about the problem. They're focusing on the customer. They're, um, they're, they're looking at different ways to user test uh, new ideas that they have, but they're not n- necessarily running things by dev before they do it. Um, this, is, this is a common problem I've seen happen all the time. Um, and then they get sold on one particular thing. It, it was the winner of the usability test. It was uh, you know a, j- just like the best thing ever. Everybody loved it. And they share this this great new feature with dev, and the same thing happens as the slide before, where dev says, hold on, guys, we can't do that. The stack won't let us do that, you know? Um, if, if you want to do that, it's going to take, like, way longer than you think it's actually going to take to build this feature, right? So we don't want this either. We want something more along the lines of this. And this is kind of a new concept because it pulls dev further up the funnel into the creative problem-solving process. And you guys may be thinking, but wait, isn't that UX's job? Um, and, and it is to some extent, but we all have different backgrounds and different points of, um, of you know, our professional history that we can draw from to provide insight into potential feature solves earlier in the process, right? So in this process, everyone brings um, their expertise to the table. Um, We're communicating, um, and I will show you guys kind of what that looks like uh, in the next slide. Let's talk about what's possible here. Uh, So this is what we're talking about. It's called, uh, I like to call it dev design thinking. You guys may have heard design thinking before. Um, It's a process for creative problem solving, and a lot of UX um, kind of lean on it to, to figure out the problems they're trying to solve. Um, So what we're doing is we're aiming for everybody to get a seat at the table, again, up front in the process. Um, And if we're all working together, um, you know, we need to be speaking the same language. So this is kind of a a high-level run-through of what design thinking is. And this is useful too, right, is like, as engineers, I think it's useful to understand kind of like what the design process looks like and what it looks like to like start syncing those two up, right? I think this is a new idea. Um, but yeah, yeah, let's jump in. Yeah, so the first pillar of design thinking is empathize, right? So let's take ourselves out of the equation and start thinking in terms of what our users are experiencing on a day-to-day basis, right? Because we're so familiar with our product that we kind of have a biased opinion about it, right? Um, so a great way to get empathy for our user is to get um, user interviews and surveys. Um, and we, we typically do that um, yearly uh, at a lot of companies I've worked at before. Um, this is a great way to, to just kind of get the pulse of what your users are, are thinking. And uh, this allows you to dive into these real world scenarios that have the greatest impact, 
right? Because that's what we want to solve. We want to solve what's going to have the greatest impact for our end user. Um, the next thing, the next phase after we empathize is we define, right? We pick the worst problem that the customer is experiencing and we pick the one that we can control, right? Because let's face it, when you're working at a larger enterprise, there's a lot of different problems and you might not necessarily control all of them. You might have you know, a tiny little sandbox to play in. So we wanna focus on what, what we can solve within that sandbox. <clears throat> And ideation, so I think this is one of the key parts where devs can start contributing to, to that. Um, it's by getting devs up earlier in kind of this design process, um, you can really start to s determine what is or is not possible much earlier, right? Instead of a designer going down and like generating much ideas that aren't gonna work or are gonna be real expensive or whatever, if we can start, if engineers can start ideating early how they're gonna actually be building that, um, that can really help design product from going down the wrong rabbit hole. Right, yeah, if you have a feature idea from a dev perspective that can be done in two weeks, mm -hmm. um, you know, we definitely wanna keep that in mind when we're looking at the broad spectrum of ideas that the whole team comes up with, right? Because UX might have a pretty cool idea, but from a dev perspective, it might take four to six months to get to where UX wants to be, right? And also considering all the other teams that might be involved in a more robust solution to the problem. Um, so it's really great to get dev involved because the, you know, they have their ear to the ground when it comes to the, you know, the stack of code, right, and what, what we're really able to accomplish. Right. Uh, so this part has actually been tricky for us. It's, I think, as en engineers and devs, we've been kind of taught to just, like, take, take a spec and kind of just program it up. Um, honestly, one of the hardest parts of my team has been, and like making them feel like they can start contributing ideas. Because um, our designers, they're listening and they want that feedback, they want help ideating. And I think a lot of devs want to feel like they own that product. Um, but making them feel like it's okay to actually do that is important. And if you're a leader on your team too, I think your most important job is like over and over again, reinforcing that anyone, like an idea can, can come from anyone on the team too and then constantly bring that out. Um, Something we do too is we'll take dedicated time out to actually like help generate those ideas because they're generally pretty busy working on code, um, but it's important for us to kind of pull that out. Yeah, and if this is only able to happen at like a higher level, um, that's okay too. Uh, you know, we don't want to take away from from valuable sprint time. Uh, we realize that everybody's you know time is very valuable, and another meeting on your calendar to to do something like this, um, you know. You have to kind of prove that out, prove that value out. Mm -hmm. um, so you could start small. You could start with one developer in the room whiteboarding, right? You don't have to have the whole team a part of this process. But just getting that one extra piece of insight into what is possible is going to help inform, you know, the direction that we take moving forward. Yeah, so I mean, we, we kind of touched on this too, but I think it's important for, um, and even if you can't be involved like the design phase too, the bare minimum you should be doing as a dev team is kind of getting involved early to kind of at least give your feedback on it. Um, yeah, there's, it doesn't have to be all in. We're, we want to give like an ivory tower approach, but there's still small actionable things you can do today, right, to bring homes or making that happen. Totally. All right, on to the prototyping phase. Um, so this area is typically owned by UX. Um, there's a lot of tools out you guys might be familiar with like Envision, um, Framer X just came out, that's pretty cool, uh, JS for prototyping tool, I think they're built in React. Um, and then there's you know the classic ones like Axure, um, Adobe XD is another new one, but uh, typically what we do is we'll build out this prototype and then we'll get user feedback on it. And you know we would love if, if Dead came along on the ride for it, but they don't necessarily have to. Right, because we're we're partnering with user research to uh, to kind of figure out kind of the game plan for how we're going to test it, um, and it's okay if um, if Dev wants to kind of take a back seat for this part, um, but if if you feel like you need a way more robust prototype and maybe you do want to bake something out and fully you know HTML CSS JavaScript, that'd be awesome. And um, you know this is where you can voice your opinion and say, hey, you know I think. Um, you know, the prototyping tool you're using isn't going to do this thing justice. Let's, let's maybe look at some options on how we can, you know, make this thing, uh, you know, more, fu more fully functional. Uh, I just want to say, does this robot look like Vince McMahon at all? Does anyone know? 
from the WWE. <laughs> no. I'm getting no's. I'm getting no's from the crowd now. <laughs> just like walk. Okay, never mind. Um, <laughs> great. <laughs> Uh, so then we move into the testing phase, uh, and this is actually an area where I think dev can um, join in. Uh, if you've never been a part of an unmoderated usability study, I highly recommend checking it out at least yes. once. Yep. It's, it's kind of wild. You're behind you know two-way uh, glass mirror um, looking at somebody that's using your product that you've built, right? Um, especially if they're testing production. Um, there's there's been a couple production tests I've been a part of that um, I've had Dev being a part of with me, and you know they they come out of it thinking, holy shit, you know, I didn't realize that you know it, it took so long to load the list page, you know, or it took so long to you know you know get, get to this feature or whatever. Right. Um, so it just it gives you that extra insight into the customer problems, right? And, you, and it gives you a little bit more empathy, and mm -hmm. it, it actually almost inspires you to want to like you know want to crush these these problems better, you know? Well, I think there's just like a disconnect too. And I feel this too, like, um, I mean, for, um, we work in bestbuy.com and our site, like, like thousands of people use our, our site, but it, it's easy to forget that, you know what I mean? You ship the code out and it's easy, it's easy to forget that people are actually like using it. And I think actually seeing it, and I noticed with my team too, they, um, I don't know, it like helps connect the dots a little bit. I don't know, it, it, it's just, it's, it's easy to forget. And we actually seeing someone use it. Yeah. Makes it real. That's great. Makes it real. <laughs> um, so the last part of this is not an actual tenant of design thinking, um, but it's something that I think is um, is potentially a new process that could be uh, instated in a lot of different companies, and it's this idea of a micro hackathon. Um, and like I alluded to before, with innovation, um, you know, maybe we do want to see if we can vet out that um, you know web VR experience. Um, but we're just not sure if we can. So what if we took some time to, you know, some time out of the sprint to get design and dev together for like a week and just see if they can crack this thing and see if they can make it work, right? I don't think we take chances enough in our industry. I think a lot of times we tend to play it safe or kind of copy what the other guy did. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in this world where there's all sorts of competition around, uh, if you can stand out, that's going to be huge. It's gonna, you know, even if it's one little feature, um, you know, you're raising the bar to that next level, um, and doing it yourself is uh, is a pretty considerable achievement. So, you know, let's let's try to let's try to break this thing and try to see what we can do. Yeah. So another thing, I'll, I'll say a couple more things about that. So, you, this this like a micro hackathon could be a lot of things. For example, like maybe you have a new feature you're working on, like treat it like a little mini hackathon. I think. Um, Something that we do too, I think those are good chances to kind of encourage growth too. Something we've done too is like encouraging designers and devs to switch roles for these little hackathon type projects. Um, and I think that the switching of roles is a good way to build empathy for the, the other person on the team. Um, and, and also to expand your own personal career. We've used it as a huge career growth thing too. Like um, someone's trying to, a business person, the product wants to break into dev, dev wants to try product, QA wants to try design, right? Like mix it up a little bit too, um, and if your company isn't willing to like host a hackathon or let you mess around with on feature, like real world feature work, um, I'd encourage you to go out into the community and get involved with hackathons too. Um, those are a really great way too to kind of flex your skills too, and maybe work with someone that maybe wouldn't. So for example, um, I like to go work on new programming languages that I don't f frequently get to work on at hackathons. Um, I I, for the last global game jam, I worked on a uh, 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 NES game in Rust, uh, but I would never used it before, so I worked with a Rust expert and be able to figure it out too. But I also see people who are, you know, trying out design or dev, or they want to make a soundtrack for it or whatever. Right? It's a good chance to, to try out new stuff. Awesome. Cool. All right, part three. So we talked a lot about kind of the upfront work of ideating and testing and prototyping, and now we've we've really got ourselves sold on what this feature is going to be. So this next part is going to be kind of what, what working in the sprint looks like. Cool. So um, this part too, so right, we're kind of going through the flow of what, it, what this looks like to integrate devs more early into the design process. Um, but I think this is like, imagine we're at the part now where we kind of, we know what we want to do. We have a vague idea of how we're going to do it. Um, and now we're about to just start actually 
making the thing, right? Um, so uh, we call it design dev workshop. So um, a couple of things to consider. Uh, when designing, a lot of times what happens to, and we see a lot at Best Buy, but it's um, design, or the design and product people work on stuff, and maybe they'll have it ready to go months in advance. Uh, and eventually, once devs are like finally ready to get their hands on it, um, design and product may be working on the next thing, right? Um, I think it's important for engineering to kind of initiate that. Because um, they're kind of, they may be doing other stuff too, and, and if you want to start, when we're deving on it too, we want to make sure that we're pulling design in on that too, right? I want to make that clear too. It's like, it's this whole process is, it's not a person's job. It's kind of a, a new way of thinking about how you're interacting with design and dev. And ways for you to communicate closer uh, and more often. Um, so yeah, devs, I think it's important for devs to initiate kind of pulling the design team in there early. Um, cool. So, uh, so as an engineer, right, when you're pulling something in, probably have like a Jira ticket or something like that, right? Um, make sure you're pulling that in and keeping it lean by maybe even pulling in a design or two. Um, yeah, so I would, yeah, you want to make sure like you know what you're doing before you go in there too. Um, something that we think is really important too is checking in with the designer before you QA it uh, or before it goes into like lower test environments or whatever. Depending on your release process, uh, it, and for us, what happens is the further it gets into production, the, the more expensive and time consuming it is to make that fix. So if you can pull in design, like while we're still working in a local, like local environment or test, it's really easy and fast for us to iterate on it. Um, so relatedly, I think it's important to, like as an engineer, especially the front end engineer, we are required from time to time to um, make some design decisions, um, but, uh, I would still urge you to consult with design, um, right? It's gonna be impossible for design to cover every single scenario for a responsive design website, right? So there's, there's gonna be, or maybe they forgot an error state, or maybe they didn't consider certain endpoints going down, right? There's always weird endpoints that can't be contributed for, and it's up to us to try to help figure that out. Um, something we see a lot too, if something is left out, um, we encourage them to like follow up with the design team to like get those sorted out, because yeah, that's just how a good development works. Um, and lastly, as an engineer, um, not all companies have this, but actually, so does anyone have like an internal pattern library or style guide they use? Couple? Yep. Um, if you are lucky enough to have one, Best Buy has one. It's a clone, or it's a fork of um, Bootstrap. Um, but actually, Eddie's one uh, on the governance committee for that. Yeah. Uh, uh, always try to lean on that too. Um, if you don't have one, I wouldn't recommend it for small teams, but if you're on like a medium to large size team, I would recommend starting to consider getting a standardized pattern library. Um, for something that we do too, um, for example, pulling in an image carousel or uh, a button or I don't know, anything, right? Radius, font size. Padding, right? Yeah, margin padding. We, we don't have to consult design for every single one of those just nitpicky design decisions. We just have a standardized library. Um, so that helps us keep our, reusing our content, allows us to move faster. Um, allows us to have more standardized features on the website so these buttons don't look separate depending on which team developed it. Um, and we don't, have to, we don't have to bug them unnecessarily, right? We can, we can stay focused on like core business stuff or new feature work instead of design decisions that have already been solved. Yes. Cool. Yep. Anything else to add about that? Um, no? I think that too, this, this is something that you know, as you start doing this workshop model and you start learning, you know, what to expect from your UX, um, I don't want to say you should be doing it less, but you kind of get to the point where you can almost predict what they're going to call out, right? So, so you, if, if, especially if you're the, the dev that's usually picking up that front end stuff. Um, so maybe just having a couple of these working sessions is going to help you understand, like, what's important to them and what, you know, it also helps design figure out, you know, like, how, how can I better communicate this to you so, so we don't have these, these bugs that come up after things have gone through tests and, you know, a day before we're going to release this thing. Um, you know, make it kind of a, an iterative process where you're kind of learning as you go. Yep. All right. Oops. Going the wrong way. <laughs> Here we go. All right, so uh, this is a call for designers. Um, a lot of you guys might be getting inspect files. 
um, or Zeppelin files uh, as a handoff from your de- uh, designer. And um, a lot of times I've found that devs just kind of assume they, they understand how to use the tool um, or maybe they don't even use the tool at all and they'll just like look at a screenshot. Um, th- this is actually a really uh, helpful and important piece of the lean process because uh, before tools like Inspect, um, we had to kind of redline everything, kind of call out, okay, it's, you know, this is the border radius, this is the margins, the padding, right? But now with something like this, dev can just go in. I think it's, uh, it's, it's all web-based. So you just you go into the design on the web. You don't have to have a copy of Sketch or Photoshop. And you can see right then and there, you know, okay, this is the margins, the padding. You can kind of figure it out. Font size. Um, font size. All that stuff is, is baked into this tool. Um, this doesn't mean that you don't have to have the design dev workshop. We still think that's a, an important piece of it. Um, but understanding how to use this tool um, effectively um, is, is really going to help you, you know, have better conversations with your designer. You're going to be more efficient mm-hmm. with your designer, right? I think this has been one of the biggest and best things we use. Who here uses Envision or something like Envision? Anyone here? No, you guys should totally look into it if you're not using it. Um, it's totally changed the way we look at it. There's a dev mode in it, which is awesome. Um, I compare having Envision like having a linter for our code files. And I, I mean that with our PRs, right? By having a linter, I don't have to be nitpicky in my PRs to my junior devs about spacing and indentation and parentheses, right? The linter takes care of that. It's the same way here with this. I can just, instead of having to bug the designer about nitpicky stuff like padding and margins and font sizes, I can just go on this tool and it shows it all for me automatically. Because um, he's right, the, use, my, the way we, I used to do it, I got a PSD, I got a PDF of a PSD a engin, or designer wrote up for me. And I had to just guesstimate what the heck that was and translate that into CSS. That's kind of right. And never pixel perfect. Um, not that we do pixel per- perfection anymore, but um, it solves a lot of that problem. Um, one note that it's like it's not perfect. We're not copying pasting designs. It's a WYSIWYG editor, right? The CSS is going to be mostly junk, but there's still lots of awesome stuff in there too. Uh, one other thing I'll add too is this makes asset collection a lot easier. And I don't no longer have to bug a designer if I need a PSD or, or a PNG or a SVG or whatever. I can just pull it straight out of the design document and into the my code base. Um, so again, it's, it's saving you from those nitpicky conversations you may be used to having and keeping them more directed towards business value so you can just kind of solve your own problems. Because as devs, we want to solve our own problems. I don't like bugging people. I don't like... Right, but now I can just, I, I know I can look in the documentation to get it solved myself. Awesome, cool. Engineers, yeah, so um, this one I think is still is great too. I think um, I would, as an engineer too, make sure that your designer knows how to use basic stuff in the web too. It's been huge for us, especially when we're about to deliver a project. I, we'll have our designers come into our like environment, like a test environment and they can help us out too. Because a lot of times what my engineers miss is the little tiny nitpicky details. Um, and our designer can go into the dev console or elements and check out the CSS and tell like, hey, you actually used the wrong margin here or the wrong padding, right? They can actually like start fine tuning and actually see what we actually are doing and make those comments. Our designers are able to give like specific and actionable code review comments to our designers. So even like a junior developer can go in and like make those changes easily. Um, but that's because he knows how to use the browser. Um, I wouldn't recommend, like, it's good to know programming and a little bit of CSS, um, but the most important thing, and I think you'll talk about this too, Eddie, is like yeah. just knowing the basics of Chrome DevTool, specifically the elements tab on there. Uh, yep. And I would, if you, if your designer does not know it, um, I would approach that uh, very uh, cautiously. No one likes to be told what they need to know, you know what I mean? Um, I would try your best to um, non-condescendingly <laughs> uh, teach that or approach it to, or ask if that's something they're interested in too. Because chances are they, they probably know that the skill they probably need to know, um, and they may just like not be there yet. So yeah, and if you have any tips on Yeah, um, as someone who was once a junior designer, um, I can say that when I was, uh, when my eyes were open to this, uh, I was totally blown away. It was like a whole new world for me. I was like, oh my God, I can get in here and I can see the exact margins of paddings. And I, I had no idea this was a thing. This was back, you know, like 10 years ago. But like, still, I, I, I was not um, embarrassed or I was, I, I was not like angry in the least that I was, you know, shown this. I, I was actually very thankful um, that I was 
you know, kind of my, my eyes were open to this whole new world. So, uh, you know, don't, don't be afraid to, to share this because I think you'll, you'll make your designer pretty happy if, if they don't know about it. Totally. Well, that was the same way when I got taught in vision. It was like, yeah. <laughs> it was totally that, op that open, like eyes open moment, right? It's like, this is incredible. It's just like, this is a game changer for me. Yep, super thankful. For sure. Cool. All right. Part four. This is where we kind of get into more of the soft skill stuff. Um, it's pretty straightforward, but I think it's still important because these problems are, they still exist. And mm -hmm. it's like, why are these problems still here, right? Mm -hmm. So the first thing uh, I'd like to talk about is just siloing yourself or being siloed off into a corner somewhere away from your team, right? Um, it may seem like not a big deal because, you know, you're a coder that likes to have your headphones in, but this can actually have a pretty huge impact um, in the day-to-day. -day. Um, not being a part of, like, team camaraderie and just, you know, kind of being off in your own little corner, um, it, it really kind of um, reduces the ease at which you can communicate with the rest of your team, right? Um, and this is particularly difficult for people who work remote. Is there anybody that works remote in here? Yeah. So I, I cannot relate to you because I've never worked remote, but um, I can imagine that this issue um, exists mm -hmm. um, in a different way that, I, that I'm not, um, you know, able to speak on. But just, you know, be cognizant if you feel like you're kind of sequestered off into a corner and uh, you, you're, you know, in the back of your head, like, not super okay with it. Um, you know, don't be afraid to, like, voice that and, and speak up and see if you can get closer to the rest of your team. Even if you're an introvert like me, like I'm totally an introvert and f I remember my first job, that totally happened to me. I was literally in the back room in a corner doing design work away from the rest of my team. And I worked at that company for about two years and uh, I, love, I love my job there, but I never felt like I was really a part of the team. Yep. You know, I was almost an outsider, right? So you never want to have that feeling, especially after the fact when you've worked somewhere, um, you know, try to, try to nip this one in the bud ahead of time. Yep. Well, especially with devs, too. I think we, devs, a lot, that's a common thing, right? And, and a part of that's out of necessity. Like, in order to do deep work, sometimes we need to disconnect in order to do that deep work. That's true. Um, and I think that that's important. But, 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 um, I think it's still important to you to make an effort to fight that, especially if you're remote. I think one of the challenges of remote is it is easy to get disconnected. Um, I want this talk to just be a, like a, just a, like, it, this is all be just gentle reminders to kind of, that communication is important and that you should be making an effort too, right? It's not magically gonna happen. Relationships don't magically get better, but, right. um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, and I think it's everyone's, it's everyone's, it's not designed job to initiate that connection. It's not Deb's job to initiate that connection, um, but that you should help being done. Um, I think too, Leadership should be helping that too. So if you are a leader in the room too, and if you're seeing that, try to help connect that too. And we talked about some ways, right? Like switching up jobs, kind of getting lean, making that process lean. Try to like, try to find ways to improve communication on your team. Cool. And this, yeah. and it, it, this is kind of the same thing. Yep. Uh, we already really discussed this, so. Well, this is, I think, I, so I mean at Best Buy, right? We have a separate UX team, which has separate leadership, and it's separate than engineering too. Um, Actually, and this is something Eddie does I think it's really great too that not a lot of UX does, but he sits with his team, um, with, with his like engineering team, uh, which is great. Um, ours sits with the UX team usually, but we pull them over whenever we need them, especially like we're like doing design process or at the end of a feature when we need to iterate quickly on those final UX touch-ups to deliver on time. Um, but for us, having that proximity is really close too. Um, if you aren't able to do that and you're working remotely too, like utilize Slack, set up video channels, I don't know, be available. Like when you're in crunch time, like that quick communication becomes important. Absolutely. Yeah, and this is a way to kind of help resolve any, you know, tension in your work environment. Um, this is a great tool we found last year. It's called Ludo.team. It's a, it's a great tool uh, for Agile teams to um, play these kind of fun party games together, like, throughout the workday. Um, we absolutely loved it. We play this almost too much. You can't play it too much, so you got to be careful about that. But... Uh, <laughs> But I will say, it, this definitely brought us closer together, right? Um, you're you're kind of answering questions about yourself, and you're sharing them with the other teammates. 
Um, I don't know if you guys ever played the, the game Mafia, but that's kind of what it is. Like someone's telling a lie and someone's telling a truth, and you got to figure out who's lying and who's telling the truth. Um, but you know, th- these simple uh, social games actually, you know, they connect us, right? So by the end of playing a couple rounds of this, I knew my developer that sat behind me, who I'd never had a conversation before he started playing this game, like like a lot more, right? I, I knew that he had a family. I knew that he liked to play Street Fighter II and went and traveled around the world to these different championships and all sorts of cool stuff that we never talked about at work, right? So definitely recommend checking this out if you haven't already. Yeah, we're not even sponsored them. We just really like this. Yeah. We just really like this yeah. one. Um, <laughs> um, but generally, too, I think something I have to do, too, is I have to treat, um, I, what's it, like the, the social part of my job as a part of my job. Um, and one way I do that is on Fridays, for example, I just, I just am resigned. My boss knows this too, that I'm just not gonna get much like code work done. And that's okay, but I rely on like getting coffee or setting up a team breakfast or you know, just kind of walking around the water cooler trying to chat with people. I think it's easy to forget, especially as engineers, that some of the hard, like most of our job is just communication, right? It's like, 75% communication, 25% coding, or whatever the math is. Um, uh, but yeah, I think it's important for us to kind of do that. And I think Ludo's a great way to do that. Um, there's lots of other ways. Whatever works great for your team, too. So. Yep. Ooh, yeah, most important slide. OK, I, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, this is great. <laughs> I, I think if we had to do it, this is like the big TLDR of this whole, this whole talk, right? I think um, if we had to sum up this talk, and if you're going to walk away from here with really anything, this is what I want you to walk away with. <laughs> Just communicate. Please communicate. <laughs> Please communicate. That's what it's really down to. Um, be a nice person. Try to be nice uh, and just talk more. Um, I think the things that we're driving home is we want devs to get integrated earlier into the design process. and We want to improve communication between engineers and designers. Right? Um, Yippee, it's a fun conversation. And it's not always fun. It's not always fun, but we, we have to do it. I think it's, impor- it's important for us to do that. Um, and I think we're all capable of doing it, too. So, uh, cool. Yep. Recap. I love this part, too. People always, like, wake up and you put a recap slide and stuff. Uh, we're almost there. Almost there, guys. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, so recapping, um, get engineers involved early and often, uh, establish that clear vision as a team. Early. Early, right? Yep. Um, share your knowledge, be open. You don't, you know, we're not forcing you to teach a designer how to code just like you, but you know, if you see an area for improvement, you know, by all means, mm-hmm. take, them, take them aside and, and share something awesome. There's a um, Winston Churchill quote that just reminds me of, but it's a, I'm always ready to learn, but I'm not always ready to be taught. Um, does that ring a bell? Does that like sound like anything? I feel like I know that too. Like I, I know I'm like always like I'm ready to like learn stuff, but if someone tells me something, I'm always kind of yeah. I, what I'm trying to say is just like <laughs> I always just whenever you're teaching something, be just be just be nice about it too, right? Not yeah. condescending. Cool. Um, strive for innovation, yep. even if it's challenging. Try to push for that with your product teams, yep. right? And devs too, right? Push for stuff like if you want to do some innovative new features or if you have a brilliant idea or if you just think like performance or dev, this DevOps workflow is important, that's in, that can drive innovation in your, in your product as well. Totally. Yeah. Collaborate. Yeah, that's a big one. Just, you know, get more involved with that other side of the team that you're not familiar with. Yep. And last, I think this is the last one. Yep. Be a cool human. Just be nice. Just be nice, please. <laughs> That's it's that easy. <laughs> it's <be> controversial. <laughs> um, cool. So let's see here. Um, we got some time for Q and A. I think we got like 15 minutes left. We're probably not going to have the entire time for Q and A. Um, but and then I also want to say too, Eddie and I, we're going to be out. We're going to hang up here to the end, and then we're also going to be in the hallway. Shit. So if you want to like talk about stuff or share design, engineering horror stories with us too, we'd love to hear that stuff too. But yeah. I'm going to go to the next slide, too. Anybody have any questions? No? This is a classic. Oh. Yeah, please. Yeah. Restate the question. Yeah. So, um, the question so is, right, it, do we have experience with uh, UX UI getting 
started earlier in the agile process? That's but, but more like manageable. Oh. Yeah. No, we've uh, we've talked about that. Um, we, we've we've talked about a couple different processes. Currently, our UX team is working in Kanban, um, outside of the the Agile framework. Um, but we are thinking about other ways we could approach, um, you know, more lean UX uh, processes like design sprints, for example. That's that's one that that's mm -hmm. kind of the you know the hot topic right now. Um, but nothing, nothing agile, not yet. Yeah. yeah, mainly, I mean, at Best Buy, we've been mostly just trying to, we call it lean UX at Best Buy. Yeah, um, yeah but it's basically, that just involves having less product requirements and kind of getting dev earlier, or less waterfalling, but yeah. we're still working on that. Yeah, good question though. Any other questions? Yeah, up here in front. Mm. Yeah. So the question is, um, are we bringing QA in earlier to the our lean UX process? Um, yeah, I'd say yes, we are. Yeah. Um, I think for us to QA has been helpful for like calling out for like this. This is a problem for us, and I think it's a common for a lot of problem a lot of companies. But getting good test data and lowers too. Um, sometimes it takes a while for us to get good test data. Um, and even then, we're able to like get that process rolling way earlier by getting them involved earlier. Um, I will say they're not as involved as our dev team is, but we do still clue them in to a couple of meetings. Yeah, we have to. Yeah, I think that's a great call out. Um, that we definitely would like to get them involved for sure. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, yep, yep, yep. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, so, initially, uh, I would say you kind of start at a higher level, right? With um, with your management, um, and and you know you, you don't want to cut the. The, the guys with their hands to the keyboard out of the equation, um, but you, you kind of want to experiment with with a smaller group first mm -hmm. and see how that feels, right? Um, I think that the more people that you have, uh, you know, you could potentially get a lot more ideas, which is great. Um, but there are definitely challenges there. So yeah, th this is something that we have tried to kind of you know figure out as we go what that sweet spot of, of people is. Um, and it, it really changes project to project. Um, and you can also tell by like who's available when, um, you know, what the meeting room and the size is gonna look like. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you kind of play it by ear, really. Yeah, I'll say something too. I, it's, um, so personally, my favorite team size is like hackathon startup size. You have like, uh, like a designer, a dev, and like a product person. That's like an ideal team size to me. I think small, maybe two or three devs, maybe, right? Um, I feel like you're way more nimble. And something we've done too is, um, we follow like the Spotify model too. So we'll, if a, like for example, we find a team's getting too large and you're managing too many lines of communication, which starts slowing you down, we'll split up into smaller squads. Um, then that's been really effective too. As a technical lead, a lot of my job is about fighting, I feel like product wants to put more fingers in the pie and try to make it bigger and bigger and bigger and more opinions on it. Um, and it's, I, I, as representing like del the delivery, I want, I try to s stop those dependencies from developing or cut them off or kind of manage those often. Um, yeah, which is hard at a big company I found. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, but our, our, our product size, we have like four or five engineers, one QA, one UX, and a product person and a QA is about our team size, so. It's a, yeah, yeah. Cool. Any other questions? 
Wait a sec. Okay. Cool. We'll awesome. see here. Uh, yeah, should we uh, wrap it up here? So again, I'm Joe Carlson. I'm going to flash my social up there one more time. Um, I tweet a lot about front-end performance, scalable system design, uh, soft skills, leadership skills, that sort of thing in tech, too. So if you're interested in that stuff, follow me on there. Yeah. And again, I'm Edward Ecker. Um, not super active on the tweeters, but you know, still feel free to follow me every now and then. I think of something I think is brilliant. So <laughs> I don't know if you'll. And of course, it. LinkedIn for both of us, too. We'd love to connect with anyone, yeah. too. <laughs> cool. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, Hall. Hey, nice job, man. Yeah, we'll be up here, too, if you want to chit-chat. <laughs>